Ho 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 and yippee kaye, motherfucker. You know what? I actually want people to see this video, so I'll just silently curse YouTube instead. Hello! Today we're playing Die Hard Vendetta. This is a British game from developer Bit Studios and NDA Productions. I can't say much about them, but you probably know Bit Studios for Genocide 2, Nihilist, and the Itchy and Scratchy game. When they weren't tackling controversial topics or schools of philosophy, they were tied up in tie-in games and they've got a... mixed track record. So why am I playing this one? A non-canon console FPS pseudo-sequel to the first three Die Hard movies. Well, if you've been on the internet for a while, you might have heard jokes about Die Hard being a Christmas film. You may even be tired of them since they were ran into the ground harder and faster than Hans Gruber. Well, there's no need to worry. As usual, I have overcomplicated things. We're not playing the direct adaptation of Die Hard 1, and thus, this isn't a Christmas game. It's merely a Christmas gift to myself and to you. Today I want to take you on a tour through a lovely jubbly bit of licensed Brit jank. Vendetta was also, up until last year, another odd game I had as a kid that I never beat. But my mate James runs a podcast covering weird and obscure shooters, and I jokingly suggested it for last year's Christmas episode. We went in expecting something out and out bad. But then, a Christmas miracle happened. We were charmed by it. It gave us five hours of stuff to talk about, and this is a truly fascinating game. Die Hard Vendetta is a very early branch off the path which cinematic games went down. It is the road not taken. If you want to see us discussing this game and reviewing the first Die Hard movie, I'll link the pod. I also got to thank Hot Cider for sharing his research notes with me to help make this video. Oh, and I should also shout out the Shonen Flop podcast, because I guessed it on there half a year ago and I promised I would plug the episode in the Spark video. So if you want to see me talking about a horrible discontinued manga seven months ago, Go listen to that too. And for everyone else... Welcome to the party, pal. Ooh, that's a hard choice. John attacks and retreats. Bienvenue à la fête, John. Yeah, let's stick with English. We begin with a menu that is stupidly appropriate. It perfectly fits the cheap, direct-to-DVD quality this whole game possesses. It only gets better when we hit new game and get our difficulty options. This is such a wonderfully daft image, just take it in. The idiotic and idiosyncratic difficulty options where hard means easy, harder means normal, and die hardest is the mode where you die easiest. Then we've got that juxtaposition of intense action music and fiery danger orange colour scheme, contrasted by a spinning purple GameCube pad. Now you might be thinking, Snake, anyone could figure out what these difficulty options actually mean based on context, and I agree. But the developers clearly lost faith, as on the later ports they felt the need to label them. I don't know if this version is funnier, I mean the comedic value of each pad is subjective, even if the Duke is the funniest controller ever made. But Die Hard Easy cracks me up. Frankly, I don't feel like dying too hard today, so we'll take it easy and play on medium. Man, you look awful. Thanks, John. You're one to talk. We join Die Hardman in his iconic wife beater, probably because this is as close to Bruce Willis as anyone working on Vendetta was allowed to make him look or sound. He's also moved back to LA at some point, because the guy can't make up his mind. On the TV is Dick Thornburg reporting live from the Townsend Art Museum, where big names are congregating thanks to a donation from one Piet Gruber. Gruber. Well, I guess we're playing Castlevania today because this is shaping up to be a battle of the bloodlines. Genuinely. As it turns out, Lucy McLean is on the scene. Look at my Lucy. First day on the job, following in her old man's footsteps. Hope there's no glass lying around. Meanwhile, Thornburg spies something odd. Piet Gruber is hanging around with fitness instructor Jack Frontier, before unveiling not just the painting, but a truly beautiful Alan Rickman impression. It is with great pleasure that I give to you the Jacques masterpiece Lakeside Nymphs. I'm impressed. The man himself could put on a livelier performance today. An act so wooden you could bury Rickman in it. Jokes aside, I am actually charmed by how much of a void of charisma, or even creativity, Piet Gruber is. And it turns out his act of art patronage is purely a ploy, as Lucy chances upon armed goons and everything kicks off. Gunshots! Lucy! And I always thought art was boring. Yep, guess I'm off. Okay, so we're at an art museum. I guess I better talk about the graphics. I don't usually tackle this because, like John, I don't have a good eye, and I figure the audience can just see the game. 
But hey, John started it. I bring it up because when I first told my friends about Vendetta, they took a look at screenshots and thought it wasn't real. That it looked like a scene out of an old Encarta CD. I actually quite like the art style. Sure, it doesn't even pass muster for 2002 standards of realistic, but it winds up giving off a Postal 2 vibe which makes me feel quite at home. It's a surreal uncanny valley I like spending some time in. But yeah, it is ugly as sin and that game was four years old by now. One of the claimed inventors of Silly Putty, Earl L. Warwick, died on the day this game released. There is a non-zero chance that him seeing the bizarre misshapen clay specimens that are this world's inhabitants appalled him into the next life. And the first of those specimens we have to talk to is this game's celebrity cameo, Reginald Vell Johnson, reprising his role as Al Pal. They couldn't get Bruce Willis because I guess after Apocalypse he felt he'd done all he could in video games. Drop one on, it's time to jam! I'm sorry? Al tries to stop the man in a wife beater from going it alone, but of course, it doesn't work. Look Al, I'm not leaving. Now I'm not in uniform, so if I get spotted I'll just make like I was a guest who got lost. Oh yeah. You look like a real art lover, McLean. Well, I've always been partial to the odd comic book. As we make our way in, the trap is sprung. Oh shit. The entrance collapses behind us, and bam, we are dieharding. It's just John, a building full of terrorists, no backup, bad odds, and worse controls. I think age is catching up to our hero, sort of. The guy is stiff and his nerves deadened. The controls are this amazing mixture of unintuitive, loose, and rigid. It all depends on what you're trying to do and which direction you're going while doing it. It may not be too much of a surprise to learn that Vendetta was at one point Die Hard 64 and was taking pretty direct inspiration from Goldeneye. So when it dolphin dived to the GameCube, the left stick clearly felt little joy that it now had a little brother. They often wind up at odds, which is only going to help Gruber get even. The movement itself feels undercooked. Our navigation is at the behest of a joystick in the mud. Diagonal movement is near impossible, and trying to go from forward motion into a strafe forces you into a stop, which is really frustrating. Meanwhile, the right ain't alright. Turning and aiming uses a hypersensitive soft aim, which means your rotation has acceleration. So I often over or undershoot where I need to look and wind up having to awkwardly flick my sights over and over. It's as if the newborn C-stick is too excited to be alive for its own good. The tutorial has a great moment of unintentional comedy. Well, actually it has several. You can open a door by standing in front of it and pressing the action button. John's alcoholism has really tanked his reputation around here. Were you drinking last night? That was awful. There are four back-to-back -back firing range tutorials, and just getting the sight over the paper is problematic, let alone lining up anything precise. If you want a headshot, you have to gently, perfectly nudge the stick upwards but not too hard now, and then you gotta do it under pressure. More than learning to aim, I'm learning what terror truly is at the thought of having to bring these inputs to bear against actual opposition, who can move and shoot back. But hey, that's Die Hard, right? John didn't get by on being a crack shot, but with luck and a quick wit and... Yeah, I can't romanticize my way out of bad controls. They honestly just feel terrible. Sometime later, we're given a paintball gun for a combat exercise. I enter the room, quaking in my cowboy boots. And then... Congratulations, John. That's all of you. John has inhuman auto-aim. It turns out when faced with actual human foes, the bloodlust kicks in, and he doesn't want the player stealing his kills. The crosshair is practically magnetized to living people. It's like those aiming challenges were set up for a punchline at my expense, and I feel equal parts mocked and relieved. You will take a lot of seemingly unavoidable damage, but John is also pretty tanky, and exploration is rewarded with hidden medkits to top yourself up at any time. There is a lean function which you'd think would come in handy, but because to lean you have to deactivate the lock-on, it's ironically far more dangerous to try and be careful. Far safer to crouch strafe sideways and spray bullets, because for whatever reason John is Doom Guy when he's crab mode. There are only a few instances where you have to aim manually, and they must have known how clumsy this was because these scenarios are rarely under any time pressure. Well, aside from that of John's aimbot getting antsy and not wanting to wait on you and your capacity for human error. Get the hell out of here. 
and the worst case of the sticks not getting along? Wanna look up and move forward at the same time? Yeah, no. Any movement whatsoever and you will be snapped back to eye level. That left stick wants to know where it's going. Which makes any gunfight where you and the enemies are on different planes downright nauseating, and some situations seem almost constructed to exploit this weakness. There are yet more control issues. Switching weapons and accessing your inventory is pretty slow and laborious, compounded by lengthy equip animations which I presume is to add tension to gunfights and punish the player for getting caught out. And for whatever reason they've slacked Legend of Zelda style auto-jump platforming into first person, and with these controls it's not a good link. Vendetta came out a month after Time Splitters 2, another FPS which is a direct descendant of Goldeneye, yet these two games could not be more different. Time Splitters 2 is so much more fast paced, yet the controls keep up, snappy and responsive. It's a joy to play, even today. A damn shame the studio just died again in a cold embrace. One interesting note as well is that this game has both crouch and prone states, and going prone is done by double tapping crouch. With a control scheme this bizarre and eclectic, it was bound to land on one idea that would stick. This is the earliest example of that input that I can remember. The rest of Vendetta's experiments, however, are an evolutionary dead end. Luckily, one of the mixed bags of early console FPS games before standardization is that the developers also knew they had no idea if their controls were good or not, so they would give the player a ton of configuration options to hopefully undo some of the damage, or make things a whole lot worse. And I'm dead. No matter what you do, the controls are obtrusive at best. Still, they're good enough for us to carve a path through the art gallery, snag a sniper rifle which has zero sway, and save Lucy as Gruber and Frontier make a getaway with a haul of stolen art. Baby, are you okay? Yeah, I can look after myself. Oh, this is award-winning stuff. I got a big close-up of that. Level 2 opens with Thornburg doing a rather scathing profile on Gruber's partner in crime. Jack Frontier. A military man scouted by the CIA, Frontier broke into Hollywood with a massively successful workout tape, and soon became personal trainer to the stars. Yet even this wasn't enough for the fitness freak. I love the absolute scorn with which Dick delivers that. Frontier wished to be an actor, and even found some success with sci-fi romp Galaxy Thief. But when the sequel bombed, his fledgling career was caught in the blast, his dire performance seeing him replaced for the upcoming Galaxy Thief 3. Many critics specifically targeting Frontier's performance, stating that not even an alien would ever act in such a wooden way. So he turned to crime, and with reviews like that it's no wonder him and Gruber get along. So begins level 2, facing us in the wrong direction it seems. Puzzling. While turning and making our way down Hollywood Boulevard, we meet the best character in the game. Whoa, 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 I'm the owner, I'm a bad lady. Nail him in the shoulder. You won't get far. So Larry wings some fleeing gangster and we've got a blood trail to follow. But what if instead we check out Fat Larry's diner? Whoa, whoa, what are you doing? Go after him! You're a cop, ain't you? Besides getting a hint that there's something deeper going on here than a simple gang war, we can also interview the customers. You think you're so tough, but you're never here when we need you. Look, pal, I'm just doing my job. <laughs> well, hell, now I feel safe. You know something? If you don't shut up, I'm gonna shoot you myself. Whoa, whoa, take it easy. I'm a good guy. Most of the booths here have people, and they all have something to say. Dude, this place is no fun anymore. I'm sorry, did you just miss the shootings? What's Larry getting up to here on the regular? More gangsters turn up, but only my gun can talk to them. It speaks the guttural tongue of violence. This is the first thing about Vendetta that impresses me from start to near finish. Practically every NPC you run into has something to say. These are the real Hollywood stars of the show. Clearly taking inspiration from action movie convention, these bit characters depend on common stereotypes and tropes to quickly get across who they are, and this is used to good effect. They possess quickly readable personalities with amusing dialogue, adding a lot of character and characters to stages without taking up too much time, making each locale that bit more colourful and alive. 
Part of that charm does admittedly come from the surprise at the amount of effort spent. You just wouldn't expect it looking at Vendetta. Hello, officer. While stealth isn't mandatory outside of a few gameplay scenarios which tend to be rather brief, creeping through stages allows you to chance upon little skits from the bad guys. You don't have to tell me. I'm not making that mistake again. Shh. Um, hey, Greg, say that again. Greg? <laughs> Sometimes NPCs even have multiple stages of dialogue depending on cleared objectives, even when they're in an area you're not intended to go back to. This makes how few models there are stick out. It's usually the case that a budget game has more models than VAs. I've never seen the ratio flipped, let alone to this extreme. On this first street alone, I see three of this guy and two of this lad. Not to mention this guy looks pretty familiar. And the stuff they have to say isn't just fluff. Sometimes they offer shrewd hints or objectives or foreshadow events in the story. Sometimes talking to the right person is even necessary for progression. So it's good that Vendetta organically encourages talking to everyone by just making it so that so many NPCs have flavorful dialogue. Well, I guess this might delay the film, but with the director getting shot to remove. As you can guess, this does have issues, but we haven't run into those just yet. Anyway, was I meant to be doing something? What do you want me to get you a donut before you arrest that guy? Oh yeah. So John sets off after Larry's assailant, which leads us through a bank robbery. And John checks out the damage. Holy Toledo, somebody had some fun. And it turns out I'm still not done with the NPCs because they also serve to upstage John. For all of the thought and imagination that has gone into fleshing out these side characters, John's lines comprise mostly of dialogue ripped from the movies. Much of it not even being his. Christ, these guys are Robin Banks and John's Robin lines. As we make it through the bank, this stage keeps the surprises coming, opening up into a small block with several interconnected mini-objectives with eclectic, often non-violent solutions. As it turns out, Die Hard Vendetta is actually an adventure game with inventory puzzles and occasional stealth and lateral thinking challenges. While following the blood trail, we have to sneakily- This store's closed. Please stop. We have to sneakily stop another robbery. And take a complimentary set of threads. We intercept some more stolen goods, track down the guy Larry shot, and this scenario is pretty neat. It can be approached two entirely different ways. If you don't follow the blood and instead enter the store through the front, um, if you want the gangster rap, it's over there. Down below, like, below the counter. Hey, listen, I'm not interested in- Die, motherfucker! Oh, I get it. Yeah, very clever. Again, it's that charming bit of extra effort. You look like the prog rock type. We got a clearance going on. Hardcore, straight edge. We got Japanese thrash jazz on import if you want. Nobody likes a tune anymore? Notice how he doesn't recommend shoegaze, because it's fucking impossible to look down in this game. From the body we get a membership card, and by putting our disguise on, our weapon away, and blagging to the reception, we can infiltrate the blade's pool hall. Just don't get too close to anyone, and wait until it gets raided by a rival gang. From here we nick a key to the Chinese theatre, and shoot our way in to end the level. Now I made it sound simple, and while I do like this level, especially now that I get it, this stopped me dead as a kid, and even tripped me up returning to it last year. It is a jarring, unexpected introduction of so many mechanics which not even the tutorial covers. It's like after the first level, Vendetta just changes into a totally different game. None of this is helped by and I'm pretty sure many of you have been questioning, why the hell are we doing any of this to begin with? Well, it only starts making sense in retrospect. We're trying to get on the trail of the stolen arts, and all of these seemingly innocuous and bizarre actions were motivated by that. So that's our puzzling intro to Vendetta's puzzle elements. Now, before we enter the theatre, I need to quickly go over the PS2 and Xbox ports. These came out seven months after the initial GameCube release and were exclusive to Europe. Technically a longer game, as the first level starts you slightly further away from the museum. I mean, 10 seconds longer is still longer, right? After the remodel exterior, the inside gets a different colour scheme. A bit of a cooler blue to contrast the GameCube's luxurious red. This is, for whatever reason, inverted for level 2, as Hollywood Boulevard's attempt at a clear blue sky which is more drabcast than dreamcast, is replaced for an oddly apocalyptic sunset. The reason I'm bringing up the ports now is this is where such changes end. 
Seriously, they got two levels in before running out of gas, with only very minor changes hereafter. That aside, this version is very much a director's cut, featuring a 20 minute making of, heavily compressed awful sound effects balance out by toning down how overbearing the music can be so you can hear how awful the new sound effects are. Swings and rounds, I suppose. And uh, to further balance it out, the fist's got a sound effect. I can't believe having audio makes this less punchy. They also went and added a multiplayer suite. Good my, I've got to load my save. Oh, hell yeah. I uh, misspelt my name. <laughs> it's me. It's oh my god, hard. this is so fucked up looking at the uh, No, this was... <laughs> this was gonna be great, it's like DNA. Oh, oh, this, oh, this feels like Robot Wars, fucking hell. <laughs> <laughs> now the turning speed is, is fucking bop kissing. <laughs> it's, bop it's a bit bonked, is what it is. It's a little bit funny. Fuck this! I don't know if this is better or worse. It's worse. I, I wanna I wanna start moving again. I wanna break free. I lost only five speed with it again for oh, fuck. Oh, <laughs> James that oh, was wait, me. Was that you, sorry. <laughs> okay. Mm, I wonder who's sneaking through. Oh hello. Alright. Oh, oh shit, shit, I've literally run out of ammo. What he's running, he's running! Just, oh wait, I can't. <laughs> he, he took the wrong turn. I literally can't. He literally <laughs> took the wrong turn at Albuquerque. Let's get him. I got it, didn't I? Yeah, but I stole yours. Not yet. Oh. Uh, uh. Ah! No, he got me! I just love that firing the minigun lags the fucking game. Shit. Oh wait, what happens if everyone fires a minigun at once? Oh, it's not as laggy as I hoped it would be. It's gotta be better. Get I good. This game isn't. This is. Oh, how this did this I? Game isn't. Game did isn't I get sniped? Good. Yeah, I sniped you. How? For, how? I'm impressed. I'm <laughs> not like. Because you weren't like moving. No! Ah! No! No! Oh! <laughs> 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 oh shit. <laughs> oh! <laughs> this map fucking blows. Like, there's no. <laughs> you can literally only approach the tower in one direction. It's abysmal. It is downright terrible. But it did allow me to play as Fat Larry against my friends and have a few laughs for an hour. And it allowed Bit Studios to make every gaming mag regret complaining about the absence of such a feature seven months earlier. Good going, lads. Nice tactical move. The biggest change, however, is that these ports totally overhaul the controls, DN64ing it as much as it can. John's movement is no longer quite so glitchy, the soft aim is gone and John's lock-on severely nerfed, but it is now possible to actually line up your own shots, with a degree of clunk. It is a patchy patch job. Not really an improvement, but an alternative. And what few little changes remain I'll try and bring up as they become relevant, but they are startlingly few and far between. Galaxy Thief 3? Well, Frontier seems you've been airbrushed out. And this makes two levels in a row starting us off in the wrong direction. It is rather disorienting, because these places do have solid establishing shots, but instead have us face dead end so a line of dialogue can work. What's he doing? <laughs> oh, whoops. Well, when God rigs a door, John opens a window. You okay? Well, I am now, sweetie. Okay, well I suggest you find some place safe to wait. Oh man, I'd have made that set off the trap and kill me. That's a missed opportunity. So we gotta fight our way through the theatre, and once again the formula changes. This stage is staged around the stage. This one does a better job establishing our objective. Trying to climb a plank up to the screen will have it snap beneath John's bullet riddled weight, dropping us next to an organ we need to power up so we can ascend. Juice. So we have an idea of what we have to do. Find the power. Unfortunately, I don't feel like such a bright spark right now because how the hell are we meant to do this? I wandered blind for ages, checking a frustrating number of locked doors before I lucked into the exact spot they left a dialogue flag. We complain nowadays about characters talking too much and mainstream titles idiot-proofing their objectives, 
but this is proof I'm an idiot because I would have never thought to do that. It doesn't even seem within the realm of this game's reality. It's amazing how the objective you literally fall into is communicated better than the one literally communicated to you. There are yet more strange contradictions in this very room, as it also features the sole appearances of two weapons found nowhere else in the game. A crossbow, which is placed before a room which is impossible to sneak into because of the sentries placed in the booths and no stealthy situations that would benefit thereafter, we also have the one instance of the Enforcer, Vendetta's similarly unimpressive hand cannon, with its seven round magazine translating to maybe four and a half kills, and you only ever get this one magazine. Really, without cheats, it's impossible to even see that this weapon does indeed have a reload animation. Maybe someone noticed how badly they botched the iron sights and they wanted this big iron out of sight as soon as possible. So that's two weapons, at total crossbow purposes, one stealthy, one loud, handed to you back to back in a level that complements neither of them, never to appear again. Man, I love how weird games from back when could be. While we're on the topic of weapons left behind, no, Vendetta does not default you to left-handed view models and a crosshair that is at best a suggestion. Before the game begins, you can choose your handedness and your sights. I messed up and recorded my other playthrough in 4x3, so you can just pretend it got squashed. Later ports didn't have the balls to keep the big circle, which makes the GameCube version the definitive edition for me. I chose these because I knew the game was jank, and I wanted my playthrough to be that little bit more off-kilter. Though if you think about it, I may have gotten it wrong. Bruce Willis, and as such, John McClane, is left-handed, and this reticle does represent how much deviation your shots can have from the center. I may have unintentionally, ironically, given myself the most accurate yet inaccurate diehard experience while trying to make the game more uncomfortable. Did you know the creator of Counter-Strike is left-handed, and its armaments were originally on the left, but were later mirrored presumably because people found it weird? It wasn't until Global Offensive that they modelled their guns the right way around and left the old behind. The only improvement CSGO ever made, and even that was a downgrade. Upstairs we have to save the staff, and this is a mean little set piece. As we enter the break room, the terrorist guarding the door immediately sprints off and calls for the hostages to be killed. We have to book it to where they're being kept, through a room filled with enemies, or else get sent back to the checkpoint. This is a trial and error trap. Wait a minute. That's a cop! Saving them, we're warned that they've still got the projectionist hostage, and upstairs we find him taunting his captor. Yeah, let's see if he can talk his way out of this. One more word, old man, and I swear I'll waste you. Now do me a favor, boy, and stop polishing that pistol. Nope. Seems the projectionist got himself lit up. I guess we'd better save the twat. One more- Ha! Ain't so cocky now, are ya, sonny? Show's over, pal. Hey, man, you don't know who you're dealing with. Go ahead, son. Shoot him in the face. Say hello to Alfred, another classic character. He goes on odd rants, admits to being the one who let the terrorists in and is selfish enough to be pissed that they stiffed him. Someone offers you more money than you make in a month, what do you do? He says to a guy who turned down billions in bullion in the last movie. Alfred has a ton of dialogue. And if you keep talking to him past the point you need to... Uh, say, you ever been tortured, kid? Yeah, I've been talking to you. Nah, just kidding, Al, you mad old bastard. But man, does that fucking come out of nowhere or what? With the power on, we ride the organ up to the stage. Of course. As the terrorist trail leads us underground. This brings us to our mandated sewer level. And because Die Hard Vendetta is just kind of mad, it feels like every single trope you would see in one of these levels mashed together in quick succession. Maze segments with annoying navigation, stop and go obstacles with the train, chuck in a couple of platforming woes and maybe one very very slow move the bit puzzle and yeah, you've got a recipe for a very slow and boring level. And all of this is saved by Die Hard Vendetta's insane pacing and by bringing its own weirdness into the mix, as John's odd odyssey does not stop. The level begins in a little hobo camp. Sadly, we can't start a new life down here. Now, if you don't mind getting out of my way, kid, you're spoiling my view. But we can disguise ourselves amongst the bums to get the drop on some enemies. Or just kill them, there's only three. 
Our main objective down here is finding and putting together a painting damaged in the getaway to serve as evidence. Considering this is a subterranean level with maze elements, I am thankful that this is maybe the least committed item hunt I've ever seen. Of the three pieces you need to find, the first and last scraps are unmissably placed on the critical path, and the one scrap you actually have to look for is sat right next to another objective. It's like they were mandated to make this level as bad as it could be, and try to sneakily undermine themselves. I can imagine a more ambitious team making this way worse by sprinkling our objective around the various mazes or putting them in hidden crooks. Not Bit Studios. This level also introduces us to Vendetta's take on the minigun. It's got awesome stopping power and it lets out a torrential downpour of bullets, and this is all rendered worthless because you have to aim manually. Though I do appreciate its introduction for how it then ties into a door puzzle as we have to swivel it around to blast a locked door off its hinges. It gives the moment an action movie energy. I can see all of these elements in a cool shootout scene. The hero realising he's getting overwhelmed, and when the train provides cover, he spins the Gatling gun on the door behind him to make his escape. It doesn't play anywhere near that excitingly, but the setup's all there. And as we progress through the sewer, we come to learn that Frontier and Gruber are planning to cut Von Leben, their inn at the art gallery, loose. So John has to rescue the ingrate. Frontier wants to kill you. You think it's an accident you were left here alone? But I'll go to jail. It's that or hell. Come with me if you want to live. Couple funny things here. First up, that line is for whatever reason toned down in the PS2 version. And second and more amusingly... Don't try anything clever, Laban. You know I can shoot the eye out of a flea before you can hit the floor with your hat. What? Never mind. That line of dialogue felt really out of place to me, not just in how it was said, but it also really doesn't strike me as something John would ever say. Well, as it turns out... Nice job. Well, I've seen better shooting. Once I knew a guy who could shoot the eye out of a flea before your hat hit the floor. It's calling back to a line of dialogue which might not happen. Alfred's madness transcends timelines. A weird little car crash of a conversation right there. The level ends with a pitch black maze section crescendoing into a series of bottomless pits. We may have a problem. Looking at that footage, that death was more my own fault than I remember it. But still, after a maze, these rather simple jumps become terrifying affairs. And then we sluice our way out in the flood drains. Girl. We'll take Von Leben from here. Watch out for his European charm. You know I've only got eyes for you, Dad. If you know what's good for you, you'll tell her what we need to know. Get your hands off me! Get used to it. The next guy to hold you is gonna be your 300 pound cellmate. An impressive scene. Every line leaves a lot to be unpacked. But unlike John, I think I'm gonna treat this as a closed case. Too quiet around here. You know what, I would knock John, but after the life he's lived, I guess I'd be paranoid wherever I went too. Though turning up to your job at the police station with your pistol drawn is a bit much unless you have a really busy day ahead. Which of course... Take the cops out, now! He does. Gruber's boys are rigging the building with explosives. This is our introduction to proximity mines, which are one of my least favourite obstacles as it takes manual aiming to deal with. I'm hardly armed to disarm these. John says as he blows up his own place of work. I like this level. It captures a great sense of chaos. Lots of explosions, the terrorists have taken the building and are gunning down all of John's allies as they flee outside. Piet Gruber even swings by to take pot shots at us by helicopter. Do you think you can hide from cowboys? This is a siege. And as we get into the offices, we then need to start taking things slowly lest we get people killed. Let's quickly talk about stealth mode. For much of your first time playing Vendetta, you are pretty much forced into using it out of worry that you might trip an upcoming hostage taker and get a game over. It's less frustrating than it sounds, as I think what it's trying to do is sort of clever. It's trying to replicate the suspense of a Die Hard movie, where there's the fear that if John even puts a foot wrong, he and others will die. He has to depend on stealth and wits to stay alive. Because John is pretty tanky in gameplay, they've used hostage situations to fill in for that need to be sneaky and insert that tension. 
If that was the intent, it is clever. Not to mention being in stealth mode raises your weapons and makes you slower, so there's yet more risk to getting caught out. I can't imagine many people being as charitable to this feature as I'm being, but I think it's a reasonable experiment and it forces you to approach the world seriously and treat the game with caution. Saving this guy gets us a key to an armory, and we later find Thornburg who's here fishing for a story, and later save our pal, who joins us for one whole shootout. I'm so glad he got over killing that child. Let's go get some gear. Oh, where is the key for this door? If I had the key, I wouldn't be doing this, would I? Just give me some room. Die, cop. God damn, no hesitation. Well, turns out those two died for nothing. The armory is pathetic. Some armor, a med kit, and a tiny wee shotgun. Another award-winning iron sight here. I love this Spaz-12's double nub design. I shouldn't be too harsh. The developers were British. They don't even know what guns look like. But the weapons in Vendetta are tragically unimpressive for an action movie adaptation. They're lacking for punch, have weak sound effects, and the underwhelming hit reactions and death animations remove any sense of impact they might achieve. And the overall arsenal suffers not only from limited variety, but terrible balancing, with only the automatics being worth a damn due to the aiming systems, enemy placements, and level layouts. Our new shotgun particularly suffers, not just because it doesn't feel all that hefty, but because it doesn't even excel in its own role. It's still outclassed by SMGs and later assault rifles in close quarters and crowd control situations. Fun can occasionally be gleamed from the shooting in Vendetta, but not so much from the shooters. Still, we do have two odd and interesting ends here. I do love the magazine-based HUD. Though it isn't as nifty as Winbacks, which tracked if you had an extra round chambered, it is a cool way to do an ammo counter. It's interesting as well how the pistol and Uzi are chambered for the same round and share an ammo pool. Though this is another aspect of why the combat in each stage stagnates. The pistol isn't even valuable as a backup because of it. What's really out of the ordinary is how the sniper rifle shares an ammo pool with the assault rifles. Typically snipers of the time were treated as power weapons, and balanced to have high damage but few bullets. Vendetta's sniper is balanced out by being terrible to use. Another curious balancing quirk exists in how Vendetta does allow a player to go guns akimbo, but when in this mode, you can't detain enemies. While this is rarely a consideration, it is something I find pretty cool. Going along with stealth mode, it encourages you to creep around with only one gun out, halving your combat effectiveness in case you wind up needing to take a hostage, then needing to pull out a second gun when the going gets rough. It's another little thing which adds stakes to the stealth. Overall, Vendetta has a rather lacking selection of weapons, but it does do a few unique things with them. And I had plenty of time to ponder all of this, thanks to how this level ends. We free Lucy via a time challenge, once again outclassed by an automatic. Okay, on three. One, two. It worked! See what you can achieve with teamwork? Calm down, Luce. Sonic Heroes isn't until next year. And we learn that communications are down and the building is rigged with explosives. So she gives us a key to the holding cells. Down there we have to free the hacker Dowd so he can get us back online, then double back to free Nitric, the demolitions expert who just so happened to make the explosives keeping us trapped here. He seems hesitant to work with us, but we talk him around. Don't worry about me, cop. Today is not a good day to die. Hard. This means we have two back-to-back -back sequences where we have to watch them walk to where they're needed. It comprises six minutes. I want to shoot these guys for wasting my time, but I know it wouldn't be satisfying. Then, it turns out Nitric is a slippery bugger, as he disarms the door and makes a run for it. We give chase, but it's too late. John, look out. McLean. Oh, wait. Hold on. Don't do anything until I get the camera. John McLean. We meet at last. Dad? And his daughter. This is perfect. Grab her. What an absolute Sonic Adventure 2 moment. Lucy's taken, Laban is slain, Nitric escapes with Gruber, and John is still in his iconic wife beater. Next up, the Hollywood studio. For whatever reason, Gruber and his men have fortified the film factory and John's on the scene, despite Al's wishes. I got my orders and Al said you weren't to be let in. Well, Al should know me better. Don't try and stop me. Shit. We shoot the lock and John regurgitates a line. Bienvenido a la fiesta, amigo. 
And it turns out John's pretty much needed. This SWAT team needs to SWAT up. John's given access to the sound stages so he can go and sneak up on the sniper, pinning them down. This is my favourite level in the game. A stimulating set of set pieces which really go all in on the Hollywood setting. This Alien World set for once manages amazing and concise signposting. As you open the door, one goon raises the platform, teaching the player it can move, killing this guy drops him through the stage, hinting at where to go, and this guy's here too. The later castle set is so fun. A shootout based around destructible walls. It's a really engaging and dynamic encounter, full of ambushes and constantly shifting cover. A great battle below the battlements culminating with a jungle adventure set, where we have to use a prop minigun to scare off hostage takers. You wouldn't dare. It's 40 million dollars of Hollywood talent, you win. Yeah, but I don't like their movies. And John manages an original line. This level has it all. It's such a fun conceit, fully explored. It manages to play to Vendetta's strengths while keeping its navigational and control woes in check. Mostly. Ah. Optional platforming for a medkit. That's just gambling health. <clears throat> Let's talk about the story for a moment. I mean, a moment is about all I could give it, considering how little there is. It's a thin excuse to string scenarios together, and that's pretty much fine for what it is. But I do think Vendetta's a smidgen more clever than it appears. These guys got assigned to make a video game adaptation of a movie franchise in LA, an interpreted movie game very playfully. Using Hollywood landmarks like the boulevard and the theatre, this studio lot sequence, and having the secondary antagonist be a failed actor. It's cheeky and fun, a great way to tackle the assignment. We passed by this topic in the NARC video, but I do miss how games were inspired by movies in this era. The term cinematic game nowadays has a really different meaning, tending to chase after drama and prestige, where the only thing more linear and flowing than the level design is the character's tears. When games were inspired by movies in this time period, it tended to be action flicks, crime thrillers, or pulpy noir. Often cheesy and daft, charmingly unsubtle in their slipshod attempts at replicating these styles. True Crime, Max Payne, Dead to Rights, and Total Overdose are all solid examples, alongside more direct adaptations like Enter the Matrix, Minority Report, The Punisher, Jet Li's Rise to Honor, Stranglehold, and of course the game we're playing today. It was a campy period of often dodgy shoot-dodge shooters, filled with one-liners and daft over-the-top set pieces. Oh shit, it's dim sometime! Over time that campy grit was replaced by more somber, character-focused stories. There are three series where you can see the style shifting over time. Dead to Rights, Max Payne, and Uncharted. The first Dead to Rights is an absolutely bonkers title featuring a way past cool protagonist, who cracks wise and necks in equal measure. You boys should take up your grievance with City Hall. It's a story of vengeance, love, and political corruption. It's also very stupid. Then came Retribution, its 360 reimagining. It redoes the same basic plot, but tailored to the trends of its generation. The tone is moodier, it's humorless, and the mechanics are more streamlined and stages less eclectic. It's a shadow of its former self, though they did keep the dog. Max Payne 3, taken out of Remedy's hands, tries for a more grounded take on the character. Divorced from its meta send-ups to fatalism and old detective fiction, I like Max Payne 3, but it is always going to feel out of place as an end to its series. Uncharted has a more gradual shift, starting off as an adventure series with clear Indiana Jones influences. With each title, both the world and the characters become less fantastical. It starts with us gunning down mutated colonists in a Nazi bunker, and it ends with the real monster being human greed. An odd tonal descent and one last stop before the fun guys at Naughty Dog were taken out by the fungus. Nowadays when we think of a cinematic game, it tends to be quite linear and streamlined. It's The Last of Us's, The New Gods of Wars, The Cages Games's, The Senua's, and the so ons. This older era was a lot more in your face, attempting to be movie-like by recapturing the thrills of action blockbusters rather than emotional gravitas. Their gameplay tended to be varied and gimmick-laden so as to broaden how many set pieces they could recreate, and yes, this often had very mixed results, but that's part of the joy of schlock. There is one last feature which speaks to Vendetta's cinematic influences. Your sniper won't be troubling you for, uh, the rest of his life. Uh, understood. And no, it isn't John stealing yet another line from another Gruber. 
I appreciate how awkward the SWAT officer found it, though. We need to defend the cops as they advance into the studio, and it culminates with this. All clear. Thanks, John. Bullet cams. Looking back, this is probably why Kidney owned Vendetta. I adored bullet cams, and I'm still rather fond of them today. I first saw one in Nerf Arena of all places, and had been a sucker for them since. Vendetta uses these for certain kills, typically to signify the end of a fight. It's a good way to reward the player for a job well done. Vendetta stands quite far apart from many of the games mentioned in its controls and presentation, but I think it carries a similar cinematic spirit, trying to figure out how to adapt those same frills, but in its own unique way. After finding all the stolen artwork hidden away on the studio lot, we take off after Gruber's helicopter. With only a wire fence in our way, we have but one solution. Oh my god! Okay! Somebody help me! Oh! You're chock full of surprises, John. And this upsets Hollywood starlet Jesse Montana. This brings us to a western set and our first boss fight, Nitric. And boy oh boy, the bosses are absolute bollocks. They're a regular enemy with lots of health, and more concerningly, immunity to John's aimbot. I said Nitric was a slippery bugger, but this is not what I meant. I can't hit the target. This lack of lock-on locks in how terrible these controls are. You know what then? Sod it. Nitric's actually the second boss. Those paper targets in the tutorial may as well count if this is all it takes to set them apart. Wait, what happened? Oh god, I hit the actress. I've got to go all out. I've got to use my secret weapon. This game features hero time. John surpasses stealing dialogue to outright stealing Gruber's entire light motif so he can light some fuckers up. Hero time isn't done very well. You get it from saving hostages, and for whatever reason, the sound effect for gaining hero points is a water cooler bubbling. Mm. Could it be communication from the Felidus? The problem is, since gaining it is tied to specific actions, it's a controlled substance, and Vendetta really holds out on you. It also means the levels with the least hostages, which are the most combat-oriented, is where it's the scarcest, which is the opposite of where it's needed. More like zero time. Plus it resets between each stage, so use it or lose it. Saying that, I can't even think of a level where it's possible to top the meter out. It really should have just been generated by kills. Besides all of this, the Hero Time tutorial hits us with some worrying subtext. But being one of the good guys, you can even out these odds by using what I like to call Hero Time. I'm not sure what to make of the implication that cops in the Die Hard universe have access to slow motion. Well, at least it comes in handy for bypassing the horrible boss fights. Is he okay? Yeah, he'll live. John, you shouldn't have been here. Look, Al, I can't sit around waiting to hear what's happened to Lucy. Yeah, well, you know that trailer you demolished? It contained Jesse Montana. Yeah, we met earlier. She's got a lot of clout, John. The studio's insurance company is going ape shit, and she's pressing assault charges. I hate to do this to you, man, but I gotta lock you up till we can clear this up. I need your badge and gun. And your hero time. So we join John in jail. And I am stunned he's not in a wife beater. And since the guy's already filled with lead, Nitric is trying to bulk out his heavy metal poisoning with some mercury. Tuna. Yeah, I recently acquired the taste. He brags about how Gruber's going to come and break him out, and right on cue, the gunfire starts. Nitric's cell opens, and thus begins the most diehard level in Vendetta. What is it with you, John? How can the same shit keep happening to the same guy? I like how we're getting a callback to a callback about how contrived it was that John was in a situation like this twice. Never mind how many times he's been in this situation today. That said, I did call this stage the most diehard, and by that I mean, John trapped in a building with the enemy, he can't easily leave, the odds are against him, and he has to overcome from the bottom. 
The art gallery and sort of the police station also use the Die Hard formula, but this level is the best encapsulation and adaptation of the Die Hard structure, I'd say. So last level we talked about movie games of the time, but let's dig more into adapting Die Hard itself. Many have taken from its structure. Half-Life, System Shock, and Arkham Asylum come to mind. Die Hard is pretty much a non-horror take on the old haunted house where you're trapped inside with the evil, unable to escape until it's been dealt with. Being knowingly anal about it, I don't think any game has, nor ever will, recapture everything that works so well about the original Die Hard. And I'm not saying that to put my favourite medium down. I'm saying that because games and films operate differently and I want to explore that. In the original film, John goes up against 12 guys and barely makes it out alive. This is treated as him overcoming impossible odds. Meanwhile, in the first level of Vendetta, you kill as many men as the first two movies combined and walk away ready for more. A medkit healing all that ails you, even a hail of bullets. I'd say it'd be unfair to knock games for not going for this sense of tension, it would be very hard to replicate, and instead focusing in on action and frills. If any game could make just 12 enemies feel like this gargantuan thing to overcome, I'd be pretty impressed. Oh wait, hang on. There is one game like that. You know which one I'm talking about. Brigand. Even the first stage of Nakatomi Plaza and Die Hard Trilogy have John mowing through bad guys like it's nothing. Weird as it may sound, I think the best genre to adapt Die Hard 2 would be a point-and-click adventure. It's an approach where the player is more keyed in to think like a troubleshooter rather than playing a troubled shooter. Where just 12 enemies could be totally distinctive obstacles requiring unique solutions. The prison level opens with a puzzle that wouldn't feel too out of place in a point-and-click, as we need to sneak around the guards and trade items until we get a lit cigarette which we can use to set a mattress soaked in aftershave on fire, and while the security checkpoint is unguarded, hide in a locker to make our escape. This is rather slow and tedious, especially so on my first playthrough before I figured out I can arrest the guards, but the thin margin for error and the roundabout puzzles, they're a perfect match for point and clicks and die hard both. And from there we escape into the rest of the facility, which plays much more like the rest of the game. But this level still feels the most diehard, with its many sections of vent crawling, its much grittier tone, and every authority figure failing to listen to John, meaning it falls to him to solve the problem alone. Do you know what the most diehard thing about this game is though? The thing that makes it feel like a true part of the series? The fact it was never meant to be diehard at all. Only one diehard has ever started life as a diehard and it's the worst Die Hard. Die Hard 1 was originally Nothing Lasts Forever, sequel to 1968's The Detective starring Frank Sinatra, both of which are adapted from novels. Old Blue Eyes was offered first dibs on any sequels, but he didn't quite feel up to an action movie on account of being 70. So the role was offered around to a few actors including Greg Castle, I mean Arnold Schwarzenegger. Die Hard 2 then is yet another novel adaptation with Die Hard smacked onto it, with a Vengeance was a spec script for an original movie called Simon Says. Simon Says. Four was another original script hilariously titled WorldWar3.com, based on a 1997 Wired article of all things. And finally, Die Hard 5 was a rejected premise for Die Hard 4, but the idea died hard. So it's only appropriate that Die Hard Vendetta was originally Muzzle Velocity, starring Jack, of course, a member of SWAT, as he battles a crime wave in downtown LA. Well, it seems some ideas survived. But then Bit Studios partnered with the short-lived Fox Interactive and suddenly Muzzle Velocity has to be something else. At first it was turned into an adaptation of Speed 2, a first-person shoot-em-up. And fun fact, Speed 2 script started life as an attempt to write Die Hard 3. So Die Hard 3 became Speed 2 and the game adaptation of Speed 2 became the sequel to Die Hard 3. Life is filled with fun little coincidences like that. Vendetta was meant to be this gigantic game with tons of levels, but ambitions were reined in, and Vendetta is only a small piece of what this project targeted. Die Hard's an odd franchise, isn't it? I mean, it's odd that it is a franchise. The first movie's all about this ordinary guy getting into an extraordinary situation. Now, the last thing McLean wants think, David, think, is to be a hero. With each new entry, that guy becomes less ordinary. The series' core appeal has a natural shelf life, and each new sequel inevitably erodes it. It's why the second film has that line acknowledging how contrived it is, so the audience understands, yes, it's a bit crazy, but, you know, get on board, lads. That said, with a Vengeance is pretty bloody good. Please, no! What isn't good is how this stage culminates with some of the worst level design I've ever seen. 
We fight our way to the execution chamber where the returning Blades gang from Hollywood Boulevard have taken the warden hostage. They're enjoying themselves. But I'm not. This is a time sequence. We have to break in and save the Warden, and Bits must have known how difficult to pass their levels were because you are given a very generous and invisible four minutes to find the key and unlock the chamber. The Warden's office is secreted off to the side in a connecting stairwell. It's hard to spot even when headed in its direction. It's hard to spot even when I'm looking at it, apparently. This was on my second go through where I ought to remember it's there. It's the problem of how flat and ugly this game can be. Architecture can blend together, and it doesn't help. So I nab the key, get into the chamber, and with hero time, I ensure that the blades can die happy. We're let up to the roof so we can have yet another showdown with Night Trick in an even more annoying arena, and while the first 100 bullets didn't do the trick, another 100 put Night Trick down for good. Where's Lucy? Where's Lucy? Holmes. Eating. Tuna. And then it gets even stupider. John, you've done your time. I think I just earned a lot more, but I'll take it. The next two levels blend together. It's a factory and then a warehouse, what can you do? John follows the one lead he has left, and this takes him to Caesar Tuna Factory and puts him right back on Gruber's tail, where he learns that he's traded the art for a missile from the Yakuza. I can't seem to escape these guys. And he's gonna use it to ransom money from the city. Through a series of perplexing puzzles and particularly picky and preposterous platforming challenges, he sabotages the launch and ruins someone's birthday. These two levels don't break the game's ridiculous pace, but it does feature one, well, technically two obstacles, that put the rest of the experience into perspective. It features... an antipiece. In one room we have to shoot a fish tank to fill a pit with water, allowing us to proceed. It's a safe environment with a challenge which I can tackle at my leisure. In the very next room, we then have to speedily drain another tank to free a hostage from a pretty horrifying fate. It's a memorable sequence in a stage filled with many unique set pieces. This is the only obstacle outside of the tutorial which sees any kind of demonstration before implementation. I like to imagine whoever fought up this sequence had to fight for it because they knew they had a cool idea and they had the gall to want to use it twice. And this kind of points to what I love and hate about this game. Die Hard Vendetta is a gimmick tasting menu, a dizzyingly fast paced sequence of varied encounters which is frequently inventive, filled with things I've not seen and wish other games could take and do well. Vendetta's greatest strength is also its biggest weakness. The issue is Vendetta is just as imaginative as it is utterly unintuitive. Encounter design generally works by introducing a series of problems and solutions. Take a door, it may require a key or a switch, or a kick. Games tend to teach the player how something works, and the challenge then is figuring out how to apply that same solution under steadily more demanding conditions. In Vendetta, a door may take a key, or an NPC, or a switch, or a Gatling gun, or being frozen by a nearby canister of liquid nitrogen and then shattered. Yeah, really. Now I gotta stop and expand on that clip, because this section is a beautiful little car crash. Vendetta's terrible manual aiming just saved me after I'd been wandering blind for several minutes wondering how do I get through this door. But what's funny is, it's the incredibly powerful auto-aim's fault that I was lost in the first place. When you enter these freezers, enemies are placed next to the canisters of liquid nitrogen, but thanks to John's lock-on, you are incredibly unlikely to land a shot on these which would freeze the enemy and hint at how they work. Not to mention this is a slower method of killing them in a stage which is very combat heavy and healing supply shy. So even if you had auto aim off for some reason, you're not going to go out of your way to do that. I find this so fascinating. The game's controls, its auto aim crutch, inhibits what might be one of Vendetta's few moments of very solid signposting. And even then maybe not because I'm not sure I would have thought of freezing a door and breaking it. And oh boy, we're still frozen in this freezer, because it also has you using a flamethrower to unfreeze a crank. Not so bad, right? 
Hope you notice the pair of asbestos gloves which blend into the random table they sit on somewhere else in the level. And don't get it in your head that you have to time your twist to when the temperature is tepid. Ouch. Or take hostages. No two stick-ups play out the same way. Sometimes you're punished for waiting. Sometimes you're punished for going in guns blazing. Sometimes you need to line up a shot. Sometimes you need to take hostages to save hostages. Sometimes you need to do that and then navigate a little maze. Other times you need to drop a sluice of fish on the terrorists or, in an example I sounded like I was praising earlier, find a hidden box of blanks you have no reason to pick up in a prior part of the level and then lug them over. Which is doubly confounding, as not only can you not backtrack if you miss the prop ammo, this isn't even a thing anywhere else in the game. The solutions you have to figure out are a mix of reasonable and beyond arbitrary, with no clear context for how you're meant to approach them. The only thing that's consistent about Vendetta is that it's inconsistent, which doesn't pair well with it being highly punitive. I've been building to this since the movie studio, but what I find so ultimately fascinating about Vendetta is how it almost seems to fly in the face of even what back then would probably be game design common sense, and it does this in pursuit of making a game which wholly adapts the rules, conventions, pacing, and sequences of an action movie paired with the intense resourcefulness John displays in Die Hard. Vendetta suffers because it's trying to be something it isn't. Game players don't naturally think like action heroes following their scripts, where their world is tangible and reactive to them, where they might see a piece of cloth, the camera would zoom in, and they'd know they had a makeshift rope. Players aren't as easily strung along, especially in a game where such rules were never established. One level on from the antipiece, there is one room where upon walking in, we can overhear two guards talking about a gate switch and how it works, cluing us in that we need to shoot it to progress. In a normal game, this would be a way to tell the player to look out for these switches moving forward, but in a movie, the hero applying the same solution to marginally different problems over and over again would be very boring. And so this is the one and only switch of its kind. This has its charms as every single room in Vendetta is bespoke, every area bursting with distinct personality. Turn that down. What? This tune is kicking it. By the midpoint, progression was an exciting experience of going, ooh, I wonder what's around the next corner, because I bet it's total bollocks. And I do say that with some genuine jank-fueled affection, though so little of it is in any way well executed. If it were made well, signposted better, understood how to build a rule set and teach the player what the rules are, Vendetta would be a series of rewarding aha moments instead of just constant huh moments. And there are a million reasons besides just botched execution as to why most games aren't made like this. But hey, because it's blisteringly fast paced, at least nothing lasts that long. Until it does. On my first playthrough, before I knew how to solve each and every obstacle, and even some of them I forgot, I would wander blind for ages. Then I would fail an objective and begrudge losing 20 minutes of progress, only to get back to where I was in no time at all. My first playthrough was 9 hours, my second, a year later, was nearly 7, and then a relatively quick run through of the PS2 port brought me down to just under 6. When I then edited out the deaths and stumbles, it had a runtime of 3 hours 40. Still overlong for an action flick, but hopefully you can see my point. It's like the first playthrough is a rehearsal for the real thing. And no, I'm not equating this to a platinum title. This ain't even bronze, this shit's brass. It's like you've been cast in a movie but never got to see the script and have to figure it out from how the world is built around you. Failing feels not just like a game over, but the director calling for take two. And like he's taking the piss. What I find so oddly captivating here is that while Vendetta stands apart from movie-inspired games of its time with its focus on puzzle elements, it's also the polar opposite of titles like The Last of Us today. While modern cinematic experiences smooth the gameplay out as much as possible to transport the player between big set pieces, Vendetta wants us to reenact every cool little moment from a blockbuster of its time, and it's incredibly rough. There are yet more problems. While the many NPCs dotted around the levels are a treat, they're also tricky. You need to trigger every line of dialogue in sequence from them individually, and sometimes key items can be at the end of a long chain. I'd occasionally get stuck because I hadn't exhausted every single conversation in an area to get a key that one guy has. And if you think they're being rude, the bastards shooting you are worse. Vendetta has vindictive enemy placement. 
One really nifty set piece in the warehouse has us sent through several rooms on a conveyor belt as foes lie in wait and it highlights how unfair Vendetta is willing to be. It is not above throwing you out into the open against enemies in totally different directions, ensuring you take a hit or two. It is not above putting enemies above and behind your sight lines. Ambushes are incredibly frequent and angles of approach limited. I now know what sushi feels like. The PS2 version, funnily enough, does change some enemy spawns, but it doesn't actually make them any more or less unfair, just different. I again believe this is gunning for a movie-like feel. If you respond quickly to these totally unfair situations, you feel like a goddamn cowboy. It's the quick and the dead. And the thing is, much like speeding through objectives when you know the beats has a certain satisfaction to it, some rooms actually feature great enemy placement but only when you know where everyone is so you can hit your marks, and Barry's and Jim's and Frank's. The cover and spacing start seeming very deliberate in allowing you to coolly take down groups in one fluid motion, like a carefully choreographed action scene. If there is replay value in this game, it's in appreciating knowing all the steps, being able to pull it off quickly and feel like you are playing the part of John McClane. On a Yakuza video some time back, I sort of wished for a stuntman game for action films, Vendetta is a very rough approximation of what I was getting at. This is what I'm so taken in by, and why it is a bad game. Because it is the conventions of another medium haphazardly grafted onto another. It's fascinating, unique, and seems to exist to do the odd job of explaining why a game like itself should not exist. This stage ends with a new boss, a femme fatale who was literally introduced five minutes ago. She knows her way around a big gun. He means his cock. And boy oh boy is this battle a big cock up. With no opportunities for hero time in the stage, tons of enemies and ambushes and few medkits, culminating in the most mobile boss fight so far, where you're at a height and cover disadvantage. It's a slap in the face, and honestly led to me redoing the entire level slower and more carefully, just so I'd have a little bit of a health surplus to make it through. You're too late. Lucy has no chance. Gruber will have his revenge. Where is she? And where is that music coming from? Where he killed his father. Nakatomi Plaza? He felt there was a certain poetry to it. And so John gets on the blower to Al, and after some donut based banter, John warns that the missiles are bluff, but don't let Gruber know we know so we can keep him occupied and get Lucy back. The Goober Gruber is taking things well. What? No! What does it take to kill that man? And so we approach Nakatomi Plaza, the place where it all began. Al says John knows the building better than the architects, and that's probably because it's made up his nightmares for the last 14 years. So let's get in there and pile on some more PTSD. John and a SWAT team creep up into the lobby but an ambush wipes everyone else out. And John can't be bothered to wait for more bodies, so he pushes into the skyscraper alone, immediately falling into yet another trap, set by the best line delivery I've heard all year. Yet, McLean, you are quite an irritating man and very hard to kill. Oh, I think you're catching on, Piet. He's got Lucy hostage up there, and we're in a room rigged to blow. But we use a window washer to escape to the lower floors, and after that, Gruber in the game just kind of gives up. It's a shoot-bang level, full of corridors and criminal cronies. It is exactly the sort of uninspired, directly inspired tripe you expect when you hear about a middling die-hard tie-in. But hey, this stage does introduce the final weapon set with futuristic prototype gun, and more fittingly, an MP5K, because it's only a little like Die Hard. It is perhaps appropriate that the nostalgia level is the least imaginative, but it's also funny that because of this, it's also the least diehard and the least like the rest of the game it belongs to. Something noteworthy is that the PS2 controls go through more of an arc than the story. Near the start, the rework controls are decent. The tightened up aiming isn't precise nor precisely pleasant, but it's up to the rigors of the early game and can even make some gunfights easier. But as it goes along, these controls fall further and further behind, not good enough for what the later levels throw at you. And by this point, I am begging for the lock-on to come back in full force. I'll confess, I have no idea if I was just having an off day, but the platforming also feels a lot harder with the smoother movement. It's an interesting little case study in how improvements can be misjudged if a game is built around its apparent shortcomings. The controls, the lock-on, the jumping, the encounter design. It's odd and weird and hard to call good, 
but it is working together. The PS2 upsets that balance. We free Lucy and head to the roof. John tells Lucy to stay behind and she says no, this is personal. John realises he can't hold her back any longer, so they shoot some guys together. Then they get to the helipad, and John tells Lucy to stay behind and she says no, this is personal. But this time John has had a few seconds to think up an argument. So John heads up alone to face Gruber and Frontier. And in the twist to end all twists, Piet Gruber doesn't actually care about McLean. McLean, this was never about revenge. My father barely said two words to me my entire childhood. Oh, and yet you do such a good impression. John says he won't get him his money and Piet goes mad. Now you'll pay with your daughter's life. No, 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 die. Why don't you just die? Ah! Frontier abandons Gruber, whatever this is happens, and the son of Gruber is killed by the daughter of McLean. Yippee ki -yay. Motherfucker. That's my girl. It's like poetry. It's crap. And now that we got Gruber out of the way, Frontier's off to carry out his own plot, and John takes off after him. Gotta appreciate Lucy's utter lack of concern. Yeah, this is just what Dad does. He'll turn up somewhere. Get back down here. I want to meet you and John in five minutes. That could be a little tricky. Well, try not to get kidnapped on the way down. Coming to you live from the Holmes Observatory. We're at the post party for tonight's premiere of Galaxy Thief 3. Greg Castle and his family have just arrived, looking relaxed and happy with the film's positive reception. Can I call you Greg? Sure. What can you tell us about Galaxy Thief 3? You're going to love it. Lots of battles, lots of aliens, lots of comedy, even a little romance. This film is going to redefine the comedy space mercenary And if we could genre. just talk about you... What was that? No! All along, Frontier has been out for revenge on Hollywood. Which is hard to fault him for nowadays, but we're obligated to put a stop to his schemes. And that's not going to be easy. The final stage begins with us out in the open, on a field covered in mines, three groups of enemies defending the building, two missile launchers firing on us, a helicopter overhead, and a partridge in a pear tree. This marks the only time in the game where John sounds at all worried. Watch the mines, John! Watch the mines! This is a joke! You gotta be kidding me! The situation warrants it. So run in, dodge the mines, take out the free squads, jack their rocket launcher, then take out the chopper and be careful not to get blown up yourself. Taking out the helicopter gets us up onto the roof, and I hope you got some rockets spared to take out the turrets. Gotta disable them. Okay. okay, that one was on me. So after clearing the roof, I'm a little stuck for where to go. As it turns out, we have to climb down the back of the building and clear out all of the terrorists here as well. And slumped up somewhere along the wall is a friendly wounded guard who will give us the keys to the control room. Heading in there, we get a bomb. Luckily, I stumbled on a circuit breaker on a random dead body, so we can punch in the code. And this brings us back one last time to the tutorial. The last thing the tutorial teaches us is how to disarm bombs. Then it isn't until the final level where this gimmick comes back into play. But all throughout the rest of the adventure, we have had to deal with so many other flavors of bomb before getting back to the original. That's Vendetta for you. So we deactivate the bomb, turn on the power, ruin some astronomers' research, jump down and... What? What? Failed to contact Al by radio. It turns out that after this guard gives you the key, you have to talk to him again to get the radio. Yeah, take it. I won't be needing it. Where I'm going. Al, Al, it's John. I guess he was using that to plug the wound. All of this is so that John can call up Al and say, hey, can you be in the final cutscene? Well, time to do all this malarkey again. To add insult to injury, this game over is served up just as you hit what would otherwise be the checkpoint. And beyond it, the rest of the level is so much easier, with rooms where it's possible to slice enemies once you know their terrible spawn locations, and bombs that unlike the first are placed in plain sight so you can get your defusal kit ready to go before you trigger them. Ain't nothing sneaking up on me now. You! I should have known you- 
Well, unlike John, she finished most of her sentence. But besides shooting stars, this observatory doesn't have much to it. Just one last incredibly mean hostage scenario where you need to sweep your cursor across the hostages without hitting them. Trickier than it sounds. One last little stress test of John's aimbot. And then, at the last hurdle, just as Vendetta is about to wrap up, these two NPCs don't have dialogue. You let me down, Vendetta. You dropped it right at the end. And yet I'm punished if they die. Well, game ruined. Off to the final frontier. Show's over, Frontier. <laughs> Thankfully, the hostages see themselves out as we chase Frontier to the stage. And he is yet another terrible boss fight. Any famous last words? You don't understand. I could have had class. I could have been a contender. I could have been somebody instead of a bum. Which is what I am. Let's face it. It was good, McLean. You a cowboy? He has two attacks, shoot and grenade. Use the time he's fragging to fail to frag him, and then die. I tried to face him in fair combat, but you know how this goes by now. Now what? Where do I go? What do I do? I die, that's what I do. They even made a unique cutscene. I mean, they knew you were going to see it at least once if you made it this far. It's hilarious that Frontier has a death speech which you're not meant to hear because you're supposed to be running away. And it turns out the doors are suddenly destructible. Because of course they bloody are. One last little thing to trip you up on the way out, as John makes his escape. Nice work, cowboy. Another day, another building in ruins. <laughs> Congratulations, John. Thanks, Al. Where's Lucy? Is she all right? I'm fine, Dad. Just fine. Excuse me, are you John McClane? Who's asking? The John McClane? I'm Robert Barnes, head of development at Flyaway Pictures. I'd like to talk to you about movie rights. This is quite a story. I know they're blowing smoke up their own asses a bit, but honestly, isn't a bad skeleton for an action film. But we gotta do one last callback. Don't be a fool, McClane. And that's Die Hard Vendetta. This was meant to be a smaller, simpler video, and I think like this game, I didn't achieve what I wanted, so who am I to judge? Jokes aside, revisiting this one has been strange. I'm less charmed by it than I was a year ago when it took me and my mates by surprise, but I am still enamoured by where it came from and what it's trying to do. It is a distinct failed experiment, feeling at times like a string of test rooms for gimmicks to be fleshed out and expanded upon in a full game that never was. So instead all we have is a violent and often frustrating puzzle box, interesting in its unpalatable uniqueness, charming in its breakneck pace, and so, so horribly annoying in its unpredictability and arcane solutions. It's a victim of corporate demands and overambition being brought down to earth, but while Bit Studios' other projects bit the dust around it, this one died hard, and judging from the reception, died harder on release. It's a product of a time where design was less sophisticated, where the rules were still being written, and it plays like it had the foresight to break absolutely all of them. I said this game was the first stretch of the path not taken. It is the antithesis of titles that are separated from it by decades, and that gives it an alien quality which is easy to dismiss, but even harder to pin down when you really get into it. Do I recommend going down this path? That's tricky to say, but if you do, you will play a bizarre title unlike any other. Something which illuminates how different a game can be, and that has undeniable value. I can't say whether or not you'll be taken with it the same way me and my mates were. I'm this game's white knight, and we know how that went, eh, Alice? But despite its best efforts to the contrary, I still like Vendetta. Ho ho ho, and yippee ki -yay, motherfucker. Thanks for watching. Hopefully Merry Christmas. I'd say have a Happy New Year, but I seem to bring calamity whenever I do, so have a terrible New Year. If you want to support me, please send this video to your mates. They'll ask why the hell you're doing that, and hopefully you'll have an explanation. If you want to support me more directly, I have a Patreon. Everyone who donates should be scrolling by now. $3 and up gets access to my scripts and notes, so you can see the massive pile of thoughts I try to mould down into a video. And $5 gets access to afterthought videos where I follow up on thoughts from the video, anything that didn't get in, and mainly answer viewer questions. There's also a Patreon Discord, 
just send me a message on the website once you signed up, and I'll PM you an invite. Yippee-ki-yay. Oh, wait, I already did that. 